Well, we are going to um, be reading out of Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to just read verses, uh, Exodus 14, verses 1 through 3. A lot of times, whenever I preach, I'll preach a particular passage of Scripture and, and stick to that one passage of Scripture. But this morning, I, I titled my message, Guiding Light. Now, I can tell you that I didn't watch soap operas before I got saved, and I sure don't watch them now. I do know that there was a soap opera named that. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about the true guiding light. Amen? And uh, so well, let's read out, but, but this morning we're going to be talking about that. We're going to talk about light. We're going to talk about darkness. We're going to talk about guidance, though, and direction for the journey. Amen? So in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, uh, we're, it says right here, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zavon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. I've been thinking a lot about some of these concepts that we've been studying on Wednesday nights. We've been doing a study on the book of Exodus. And some of the themes or the ideas that have come forth from those teachings have really resonated in my heart and in my mind. And I can't shake some of them out. And so kind of like this morning's message is built somewhat off of that. Uh, for the people that maybe haven't been with us on Wednesday nights, um, and I know we did a little bit maybe of this last week also, uh, but I just want you to know that the story goes that God had a people. Amen. God had a people named Israel. Uh, and as a matter of fact, sometimes I used to do this back in the day, and we're going to do it. All that, some of my teaching and preaching has to be almost a little bit like Sunday school, because we don't have Sunday school anymore, and you have people that come in at various levels of understanding. And so sometimes we have to back up a little bit and try to make sure that we're all on the same page, right? And so I like to do a timeline sometimes, just a real brief one. And I just don't want you to you know, take too much attention to the dates, but they're just kind of like roundabout dates. The, I start my timeline with the fall. And the reason why is, it's like some people would say, well, wait, hold on a second, preacher. Uh, you got all this time frame before that where God created. I understand that. We've taught on the creation. And when I come to the realization of what God created for, it was to prepare a place for man to dwell. Why? Because God is love and he desired to create a creation that could reciprocate love to him. And you know, one of the things that I say a lot of times is that you wouldn't want to be in a relationship with someone who was just tolerating you. But instead you want them to reciprocate love to you. That's how God is. He didn't want a whole bunch of robots. He wanted people that would willingly choose to live for him and willingly choose to love him. Now, with all of that said, I can get into some serious and deep philosophical concepts. And I'll try not to overdo it, but I don't know about you, but I talk to a lot of people about the Lord. I witness on the streets. Matter of fact, I plan on having a track ready and I plan on going out Thursday and Friday night to talk to people at the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival. Troy said he's coming. Bridget, I'm sure, will be there. Anybody else that wants to come, y'all just let me know and we'll do it. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's fine. Pray for us. Amen? But one of the things that I've come to the realization where people keep asking me the question is, why would God create the devil if he knew that he was going to do what it was that he was going to do? Now, I can't prove everything to you, but I can tell you this. I know some things from the Bible. I know some things from the Bible in the sense that I know God is love. And once again, I see even from the words of King David, when he looked, I believe he was walking by a reflection one day and he looked at himself and he said, what is man that you are mindful of him? He looked at himself. He looked at his life. He realized the failures that he had had. And yet at the same time, he felt the presence of God moving and operating in his life. And he pondered and he wondered, what is man that you are even mindful of him? Why? Is it that you desire to have a relationship with him? Sometimes I ask the same, Lord, why is it that you would desire to have, after all of the things that I've done, why would you love me? Why would you desire to have a relationship? I can't answer all that for you. All I can tell you is this, he loves you. He loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. And I believe that's what creation was all about, to prepare a place for man to dwell, to give him an environment where he could make a choice. And then the fall happened. And the choice became real. You see, until there's a choice, there's no choice. Until there's really a reason to have to make a choice, there is no choice. If there's only God, God is good, 
There is no choice to make because all you know is God. Before the fall, they didn't know good. They didn't know evil. They only knew God. But once the fall took place, see, even Adam and Eve in the midst of the garden where that tree was located, they had a choice to make each and every day. The Bible says that tree was in the midst of the garden. That one of the things that I learned when I taught that a long time ago was this. The temptations that you face, they're not always going to be hidden behind a corner somewhere. Sometimes they're going to be right in your face. You're going to have to make decisions on a regular basis on whether or not you're going to choose to go the way of the world or the way of the Lord. At some point in time, Adam and Eve succumbed to the pressure and the temptation of the evil one, and the fall took place. I'm here to tell you what the Bible teaches. Scientists don't, don't necessarily agree with me, but as far as I'm concerned, they have to catch up with what the Bible says, not vice versa. I have seen what God will do. I have seen how he will, and we will look at some scriptures, awaken the spirit of man, cause the spirit of man that was dead to the things of God to come to life and to experience the presence of God. So that's why I start with the fall. Because, see, the fall changed everything. The fall caused mankind to be born of sin. The Bible teaches that man born of Adam was born in sin. That's your first birth. That's why we have this tombstone right here. Somebody made this out of styrofoam. She was really talented. Uh, I used to carry it around with me before I had a church, and I'd bring it with me to churches when I'd preach on Romans chapter 6. And, I, and I, to make a point, it was an illustration. Your first birth of Adam, the first time you were born physically, you were born in Adam. That's your first birth. And Paul called him the old man, that old person that you used to be. But there's a new birth in Christ. Amen. Jesus, Paul called Jesus the last Adam. Jesus came to make right what the first Adam made wrong. Each and every human being has been born of Adam. Every last human being that ever walked the face of this earth was born of Adam, came forth, for lack of better words, from the loins of Adam, and received from Adam an inherited sinful nature DNA. The root of who you are, born of Adam, is that you are a sinner. You sin because you're born a sinner. There's a root of sin that compels you and pushes you and prompts you to go towards that which is against the plan or the life of God. But good news. Amen. The Bible teaches that there was one that was not born of Adam. Yeah. He came from incorruptible seed. He came from the Father who was born of the Virgin. He came from, from heaven to earth. Hallelujah. And he took that perfection and that sinlessness and he brought it with him on Calvary which is the hill where the cross was and there he died and when he died he died with your sin and my sin Amen. placed Amen. upon him hallelujah he was the sin bearer he was the sacrifice he came to make right what Adam had made wrong but listen, this didn't just happen A.D. 33 out of nowhere. God just didn't put Jesus on the scene. A lot of times people don't realize, look, I took a lot of Bible college classes. You know, one class I took called Unity of the Bible. I'm going to try not to go over, but right now I feel like just talking. I took a class called Unity of the Bible. And, you know, they had a lot of Bible scholars in, in Germany. And they would say many times people just think. They like to think about things. And they said, you know... There's a lot of scholars, you believe it or not, that's why you got to be careful with the History Channel, Discovery Channel. You can't just watch anybody talk about the Bible. They have a whole discipline of Bible study called liberal theology. That's different than conservative theology. Conservative theology believes that the Bible is the Word of God. Paul told Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God. The word inspired is two Greek words put together, but many times compound words in the Greek, uh, theo neustos, God breathe, neustos, pneumonia, wind, air, theo neustos, God breathe, all scripture is God breathe, it meaning that the word of God was breathed into man and through man, God used him as a vessel to pin the very word of God on parchment so that man could be communicated with from the, the creator of the universe. You know, many people that you talk to are like, the Word of God, the Bible's not the Word of God. The Bible's just another book written by men. You believe that if that's what you choose to believe. I choose to believe something completely different. I choose to believe as I stop and I ponder and I think, how would a, an all-knowing creator God who created mankind communicate with man other than through human language? God knows that man communicates through human language. Why would he himself not communicate with man in that way? You know what mankind wants? Mankind wants God to flow down in all his glory and show him something physical. Mankind wants to work. I use this 
word, this wording loosely because I had a physics major correct me one time at Christmas dinner. Uh, I said, mankind wants to use the scientific method. If I can't touch it, if I can't see it, if I can't smell it, if I can't taste it, then I don't believe it. Well, that's not the scientific method. I said, you get the point, sir. The point is, is that, you, but God says, you're going to believe me by faith. God says, I'm going to communicate myself to you through my word, and you're going to believe me by faith. And if you'll do that, I'm going to change you, and I'm going to walk with you. Hallelujah. And Jesus said that me and my Father will come, hallelujah, and commune with you. We will sup with you. Yes. You know, you don't just invite anybody over to your house to eat dinner with you, right? I mean, I mean I'm sure you've invited some folks over, but when you don't really want them people coming over, you're kind of a little bit irritated on that side. Oh, man. You know, but the people that you really want to spend time with, those are the people that you don't mind inviting to come over and eat, right? Jesus said, if you will believe me, hallelujah, and believe that the words that I have spoken are true, and if you will, if you will accept me, me and my Father will come unto you, and we will sup with you. God wants to have fellowship with mankind. Amen? And so, but the fall caused the problem. But what I really wanted to show you through this chronological timeline more than anything else is that this didn't just happen yesterday. This didn't happen in AD 33. God has been planning this event for thousands of years of human history. When you read through the scriptures and you understand it that way, it becomes very clear. The Old Testament starts to make more sense. There's layers. I saw a video, a Rand, Rand, that, I don't know if Rand's in here or not. Rand sent me a video, and I thought it was a great analogy because the Lord had already showed me these concepts before, but the way the guy described it, he described it as an apple. And he said that the Word of God is multi-layered. You see a, something on the superficial surface that has a literal meaning, but when you start peeling it, it gets juicier and juicier the deeper that you go. And that's one of the things that the Lord has revealed to me about His Word. That He is, I was sharing this with somebody the other day, He's a, ma he's a literary master. I mean, you know, like, I love to write. I like to use illustration. I don't like to use different literary techniques. God is a master at literary techniques. And His whole Word, His whole story is a literary masterpiece. And it's got multiple layers that all reveal the same truth that he had one plan and ultimately it was to send his son Jesus, the last Adam, to pay the penalty for sin and that you and I, when we put our faith in him, could die with Jesus at the cross, could be buried with Jesus in the tomb, and a new man could be resurrected to newness of life, filled with the divine nature of God, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, amen, and to to walk with God from that day moving forward. Amen. Praise God. What a beautiful plan. So after the fall, the next big event was the flood, right? I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that other than to say life was really messed up back then. <laughs> and as I could tell you a whole lot, but we just don't have time. The enemy was trying the best that he could to destroy the plan of God. One of the big things that the enemy knew was that in the garden after the fall, God told Adam and Eve, he told the serpent, in front of Adam and Eve, he said, he said this, he said, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. You ever seen the passion of the Christ? Whenever Jesus is in the garden praying, that was, that was what you would call a literary license right there. Mel Gibson wrote into the script this python or this snake slithering in, and then Jesus stood up and saw it and stomped on its head. That was literary license because what he was trying to do was allude to Genesis chapter 3, where in Genesis 3 it said the seed of the woman is going to crush your head, serpent. And the point being is that from the very beginning, the serpent knew that the seed that was going to bring destruction to him was going to come from a woman. And in the flood stage, one of the big things that's happening is, is that there's a, trying an attempt to destroy the seed of the woman. We don't have time to get into that, but God destroyed the entirety of the earth. When you read in the text where it says, and Noah was perfect in all his generations, there's something behind that. It's not that Noah never sinned. There's no man that ever walked the earth that never sinned other than Jesus the Christ. He's the only one that never sinned. Job, the Bible says he was a perfect man and upright in all his ways. That doesn't mean that he never sinned. It means he was complete and is completely devoted to the Lord the way that he understood it. What it says about Noah, perfect in all his generations. It was talking about his DNA. Yeah. His DNA was pure. He was a human being. He, yes, he loved the Lord, but there's a whole lot of other stuff going on there. But God destroyed the, 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 the uh, God destroyed the earth with a flood. And then the next thing was the Tower of Babel. I like talking about the Tower of Babel. Once again, we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but 
Whereas the fall was an individual rebellion against God, the Tower of Babel is a corporate rebellion against God. Can I tell you that same spirit still lives, still is alive today? What, what I mean by that is this, is that I believe this. You might think I'm crazy, but I wrote a book about the Illuminati and I believe it. I believe that there's an enemy that's more organized than we ever gave him credit for. Yeah. I believe that when we see wickedness that takes place upon the face of the earth, that it's not, we, we say, oh yeah, that's the devil, but I believe it's deeper than that. I believe that there's an organized approach. I believe that there's a spirit that at the Tower of Babel was trying to cause a one world order, a one world religion. And that at the book of Revelation, it says that in the end, we're going to realize that same spirit was operating through the entirety of the, of the annals of human history. And that he was attempting to bring this thing to pass. At this stage, early on, God confused the languages of man. He confused man's communication and he disrupted the plan of the enemy to attempt to bring this one world order, this one world religion together. But I'm here to tell you that through the ages that the enemy has been running a parallel course with the kingdom of God, with the salvation history of God, and through the ages has been causing deception and confusion in the minds and lives of countless millions of people. But God confused their languages. The good news is, here we get, here we go to the good news, because when you turn the page in your Bible, because this is Genesis 11 to Genesis chapter 12, God finds a man named Abraham. Amen. Now, if you come down here, it, this, is, this would be a map of Israel, and uh, this would be the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. This area here, this is the Mediterranean Sea here. This is Mount Carmel right here, where, where Elijah had a showdown with the prophets of Baal. If you ever read that, that's a really good story. But anyway, this is Israel between, these, between the Jordan River and between the Mediterranean Sea. Over here, this is the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's Iraq. There's a little place down here called Ur of the Chaldees, southern Iraq, and southern Babylon at the time. God said, Abraham, that's where he was living. Come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I don't know about you, but I watch the news sometimes. God did what he said he was going to do. He, whether you believe it or not, all you got to do is turn on CNN and you will see them still talk about a little nation called Israel. God did what he said he was going to do. Abraham listened to God. He got up out of his daddy's house and he started a wandering journey. To be honest with you, I didn't plan any of this stuff right now, but it fits perfectly in with the message. Abraham be began a wandering journey looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Along the way, he had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. They were twins. Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons. They were the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel in Egyptian captivity became the nation of Israel. They were led out through the, on the Passover night through the Red Sea and became the nation of Israel. They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness and then entered into the promised land. There they began to have kings, great kings like King David and, and all these other ones. Until finally, a thousand years after the great King David, Jesus was born, hallelujah, in Bethlehem. And we know the rest of the story. But all along the way, during the time frame of the kings, there were also prophets. And all the time, God, through the mouth of the prophets, was speaking the same word. He wouldn't only be the seed of the woman, but he would be the seed of Abraham, he told us in his word. He would not only be the seed of Abraham, but he would be the seed of Judah, which was one of the 12 tribes that came from Israel's loins. He wouldn't just be the seed of Judah, but he would be from the seed of David, who was the king that came from the tribe of Judah. He wouldn't just be the, 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 the seed of David, but the Bible says that he was the word. He was the eternal word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Hallelujah. He came from heaven to earth. He was manifest in the flesh. But listen to me. The plan wasn't just that he would be a person. It wasn't just that. And, and listen, God made it so clear through his word who he would be. And Jesus meets all that criteria. But even bigger than that, it would also be a sacrifice. He said, the seed of the woman in the garden is going to crush your head. He said, but your head will bruise his heel. Talking about it's going to inflict pain on him. He was going to be the sacrifice, but not just the sacrifice for that first family, the sacrifice for a whole family in the Passover night. 
See, that's where we are really in our story that, I'm about to, that, we're, about to, that we're about to read here, and what we, that we just did read in the Exodus passage. They have just come out of, from the Passover. They've just come through on dry ground. And, and, the, and on that night, they took a lamb and they cut its throat. They took its blood. And they painted the blood on the doorpost and the side post. And God said, judgment's coming through the land. The death angel's coming through the land. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I've shared this story before, but when I got saved, the preacher kept saying the word blood. And I've told y'all, anybody that's been coming here, no. And I, and I, but I use this all the time when I witness the people. I'm like, man, that, that, that woman kept saying blood. And I'm going to be honest with you, I felt so uncomfortable because I didn't know what in the world she was talking about because I was raised in, I'm just saying, I'm not picking on you in religion, but I was raised in a Catholic church. And I ain't never once heard no preacher, no priest, nobody say nothing about the blood. And she just wouldn't shut up about the blood. She kept saying the blood. And I was just like, why is she talking about blood? That's weird. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she stopped in the middle of the message. And she said, the Holy Spirit told me somebody in here needs to give their heart to Jesus. And you need to come up here right now. And you need to bow your knee to the Lord. And look, the Lord said, I don't know what happened right there. But all I can tell you is this. No matter how weird I felt before that, it got even worse. Because all of a sudden, I felt like my heart was about to beat out of my chest and the Holy Spirit was like she's talking to you boy tonight's your night tonight's the night you need to give your heart to me amen I knew she was talking to me I ran up to that altar and I gave my life to Jesus the blood because see it's the story God this is God's plan it required the death of a sacrifice Sin isn't something that we just sweep under a rug and say, oops, or like Britney Spears, or, oops, I did it again. Get your little Swift route, clean up your mess. No, it required the shedding of blood. And it wasn't just any blood. It was the blood of an eternal lamb that was without sin before the foundation of the earth, the precious blood of a lamb. Amen. And, and, and on that, so it was a Passover night. It was the a lamb, a sacrifice, if you will, for that whole family. <laughs> And according to Leviticus 16, it was the Day of Atonement. And one time per year, the high priest would kill a lamb. He'd go behind the veil and he'd sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. We don't have time to talk about that, but there's some rich, rich theology in there. And that the sins of the entire nation were forgiven for one year. A lamb for the couple, a lamb for a family, a lamb for a nation. And then on the banks of the Jordan River, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, Hallelujah. God's got a beautiful plan. From the fall to the very end, even in the book of Revelation, after the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, the great dragon, is cast into the lake of fire, the Bible calls Jesus the Lamb of God seven times. He bears the scars in his hands. The Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. Some people think Jesus is having to pray for each and every Christian on earth. Could Jesus do that? Absolutely. He's God. But I'm here to tell you all the Father's got to do is look over there at those nail-scarred hands. Because that's what the word intercession means. It means a mediator, a go-between. And Jesus went between you and me, between us and God, because our sin stood in the way and Jesus removed it. Amen? He is our mediator. In this passage of Scripture, like I said... The children of Israel after the Passover night have gone through the Red Sea and now they're just beginning their journey. And the Lord told Moses, tell the children of Israel to turn. I want them to turn. In other words, I want them to change directions and I want them to camp at this specific spot. And when they camp there, what's going to happen is Pharaoh's going to see it. See, most of the people that come to church here know that I just <laughs> preach this way, but Pharaoh's a type of the enemy. Why? Because he was the enemy of God. The devil is the enemy of God. And what I'm trying to tell you is God writes multi-layered. It's in the story. you got to just be able to see it. There's too, you can't say it's coincidence. There's too much there. The Pharaoh is the type of the devil. Egypt is a type of the world. The children of Israel are a type of the Christian. And the Passover lamb is a type of the cross. And God delivered Israel, his people, out and through the sacrifice and the shedding of blood. And he delivered you, Christian, out through the sacrifice and shedding of blood. And now you're on a journey, just like the children of Israel are on a journey. You're on a journey. And now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God tells Moses, turn right here. What you talking about, Lord? Doesn't make any sense to turn right here. I said, turn right here. What's going to happen is, is that old Pharaoh is going to think you're confused, that you've gotten entangled in the land. The point that I wanted to make with that is sometimes when we're on this journey, 
God gives us directions that don't always make sense. Yeah, that's right. We don't understand it. Why would you tell me to do that, Lord? Everybody's going to think I'm crazy. Listen to me. If you know the word of the Lord and you know how to hear his voice, sometimes God will give you direction that is completely contrary Amen. to what the world would tell you to do. That's right. Dude. That's why one of the problems that I have with the modern church, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not over here trying to aggravate anybody. But what I will tell you is this. Whenever I turn on the television and I see these big churches, and I'm not opposed to big churches. Hey, bring on the people. Let's preach the gospel to the people. But whenever everything's made out of gold and it's all glittery and we're all made up and it's all a big show and it's all about money and it's all about this and it's all, it's all just so beautiful. Listen to me. God, Jesus said you can't serve mammon and God at the same time. What is mammon? The God of money. You can't, the world looks at success, you know what I'm saying, it's kind of like, uh, well, I'm just going to say it, and I'm not scared to say it, and, and listen, if you've read the book, and you like the book, and if you watch the dude, and you like the dude, I don't want you to take me personally, it's not like I'm trying to personally poke you in the eye, I used to watch the dude, okay, I thought he was a good little speaker, but I'm here to tell you he ain't preaching the gospel, all right? So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and say it now that I prefaced it with that. Joel Osteen. There ain't no sense in hide. It is what it is. Joel Osteen wrote a book, Your Best Life Now. All right? And the whole book is about how if you'll do this and you'll do that, you'll be able to experience your best life now. Don't misunderstand me. God wants to do a work in your life. He wants to fix the mess from the past. Amen? But that's not his whole focal point. Hey, God has got a plan that he's working to bring souls into the kingdom. Right. And listen to me. Joel Osteen's book doesn't work too well for the Apostle Paul while he sits in the Mamertine prison waiting for Emperor Nero to pull him out of there and cut his head off because he refuses to recant his statement that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and died on the cross and resurrected his head. It doesn't work for Mark. Uh, the, the one who wrote the gospel bearing his name as they're dragging him through the streets behind a chariot in Egypt. It doesn't work for old doubting Thomas. You remember him, the one that said, the Lord said, go ahead, stick your finger in here and thrust your hand in my side. It doesn't work for him. You know why? Because he went to India to preach this message about Jesus and them Hindu people didn't like that message and they said, you're either going to change your story or we're going to run you through with this sword. I refuse to recant my statement. Yeah. Your best life now Really? With a sword sticking out of my back? <laughs> Sitting in the bottom of a dingy, wet prison? No, that's another gospel. Yeah. That's a, not the gospel. It's another gospel of a strange fire is yeah. what it is. Yeah. And it's communicating a message that's sending people in the wrong direction. It's, it's, it's preparing a place in the church where we can fill up stadiums full of people. And we can all say, oh, we just love God. But the reality of it is, is this, is that God's kingdom and God's gospel look completely different than the ways of the world. The ways of the world are building up and becoming successful. God sends his son uh, to be born in a manger amongst stinky animals. You want your child to be born in a manger? You want to be born in a manger? Of course not. You want what's best for your child, right? God said, this is what's best for my child. I will send him and allow him to be born in a manger amongst stinky animals. Whenever Jesus came into town to die on the cross, he rode a donkey. The Bible says he's coming back one day on a stallion. But I'm here to tell you on that day, he came in lowly and riding on a donkey. The world says, lift yourself up so that man can see you. Build yourself full of success and power. John the Baptist said, I must decrease. So that he might increase. The world does it all different. You talk bad to me, I'm going to talk bad to you. You give me a hard time, I'm going to give you a hard time. I'm going to come right back at you. Do I always get it right? Absolutely not. I think I kind of might have missed it a little bit this week. But what I will tell you is that something else I've also learned, a humble answer turns away wrath. That's right. But I don't like giving a humble answer whenever somebody gets all up in my grill. I want to tell you about yourself. You keep on roll, rolling that way if you want. But if you're going to be the child of God, you're going to learn that God's not going to bless your mess. <laughs> I didn't mean to rhyme, but I'm just saying God ain't going to bless your mess. We preached Wednesday night, last Wednesday night. God said, this is my plan. You're going to go out each and every day, and you're going to gather up enough bread for today. If you, if you try to keep it overnight because you don't want to get up the next morning to get your bread, it's going to get spoiled. The word of the Lord said that they, some of them refused to do what God said. 
and they left that bread overnight. You know what happened? It grew maggots. The point to all of that is this. God's not going to bless your plans when they're contrary to his plans. He's got one way that he wants to do things. He's wanting his people to line up with it. We go out in our flesh. We want to do it our way. And next thing you know, it's a big old, I'm going to say, it's a big old stinking mess. Everything's falling apart. Chaos, destruction, despair. And we wonder why. I've been there. Listen, and sometimes it's not even that. Sometimes you still find yourself. You're, you're wanting to do things God's way, and you still find yourself in the midst of chaos. Guess what? God allows things to happen to his people. Why? To put their faith to the test. Amen. Hallelujah. And when it's all said and done, whenever you've passed the test and you've come through on the other side, the Lord can say, he was my child. Let me tell you something. As you're going through the test, while you're on the journey, i got to get back to my message at some point. <laughs> while you're on the journey, you've got to hold on to the Lord to the very end. Amen. And when you hold on to the Lord till the very end, when it's all said and done, the word that was spoken of Abraham will also be spoken of you. Well done, my good and faithful Amen. servant. Amen. Not that there were no hiccups along the way. Not that there were no failures along the way. But I didn't quit. The Bible says a righteous man gets up seven times. You might fall, but you keep on getting up. God's people are getting up, folks. Amen. We don't quit. So here we are once again, the children of Israel. I've gone through the Passover. Uh, God told the children of Israel to turn right here while they're on their journey. You know, I've thought many times how in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike, God's people are referred to as pilgrims, the, the characters of the Old Testament. I looked up the <coughs> definition, pilgrim. A traveler or wanderer, especially in a foreign place. A traveler or wanderer, Wanderer, especially in a foreign place. I started, you know, I, I, lately I've been, I know I talk fast, but lately I've been stopping and trying to ponder, thinking about some stuff. He's, he's in an unfamiliar place, the pilgrim. Mm -hmm. You know, I started thinking to myself, everything behind him, he's already seen. His old town, his old life, his old friends, even what was new yesterday is more familiar today. Because Yesterday it had never been experienced, but today, yesterday, has been seen at least once. So for the pilgrim, he's on a journey. What's behind him isn't what's unfamiliar, it's what's moving ahead. See, for the child of God, as he embarks on a journey, it's a new journey. It's a faith journey. And whenever you're hand walking according to the will of God, you're doing it different than the way the world's doing it. You ever seen that picture where they got all these fish swimming this way? Then they got that Jesus fish and he's going upstream because the Christian is living his life different than the way that the world is. You may not like my preaching. I'm going to be honest with you. Hang around long enough. You're going to realize that the way, and you might not even think that I do it the way I'm supposed to do it. But I'm going to tell you what the word of God says. The word of God says God's people are different. And it doesn't just say it once. It doesn't just say, uh, come out from amongst them and be ye separate, says the Lord. For what fellowship has light with darkness? That's one scripture that just tells you straight up. Why would you be unequally yoked with unbelievers, the Bible asks. But even in the Old Testament, through the rite of circumcision, when God told Abraham to come out of his father's house, I'm going to make you a great nation. He made him be circumcised. And all of the people that would follow the will of God had to be circumcised in their foreskin. I know that sounds crazy, but what was it? It was a sign of the covenant that they had with God. What was the purpose? It made them different than everybody else around them. It was a separation. Why? Spiritually, what does it mean? It's a removal of flesh through the shedding of blood. The flesh represents the old man. The shedding of blood represents Calvary that requires death to take place to the old so that new life can come to the new. But in addition to that, God's people were different than everybody else around. Amen. I say this all the time, but how do you think that, they, that, the, that Pharaoh's daughter knew whenever she saw the little baby in the, in the, in the basket she pulls the sheet back. She says, oh, it's one of the, one of the uh, Hebrew boys. Now, how do you think she knew that? Because he was circumcised. He looked different than the Egyptians around him. The point that I'm trying to make is, you might think I'm making too much of a point, but I'm trying to say, God expects his people to look different. They're on a journey. They're going in a direction that is contrary or different than the ways of the world. And the, and, and the word of God is, is what's giving us the guidance and the direction that we need to know where we're supposed to be going. The life of the pilgrim requires faith and direction because he really doesn't know exactly where he's going. Now, the beauty of the Christian pilgrim is that in the end, he knows his final destination. Right. He knows what his final destination is. Amen. Amen. 
It's to be with the Lord of glory for all eternity. But in the meantime, like that song says at the end, the last verse, I can't remember exactly how it goes. Right now, something like bear your cross until the until the right now there's trials and tribulations on earth. It ain't your best life life now, Joel. That ain't the truth. People can get mad at me if they watch the video. You might get mad at me, but I'm here to tell you it ain't the truth. It's not your best life now. The, the life of the Christian is full of trial and tribulation. But the good news is God said he'll be with you every step of the way. God said he'll give you grace, amen, and strengthen you every step of the way. But if you want it your way right now, it's not Burger King either. It's not going to always be the way you want it. The beauty of the Christian pilgrim is that he knows his final destination, but until his resting point on this earth arrives, he doesn't really know what tomorrow holds or where it brings him. This passage in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 11, uh, 13 through 16. Actually, why don't you go to verse 8 real quick. Hebrews 11, verse 8. I'm going to get myself in trouble, man. I preached so long, I didn't even get to my message. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Or, I mean, verse 8. All right. It says right here, By faith Abraham, when he was called, I told y'all about that, right? God said, come out of your father's house. When he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he went. He was a pilgrim. <laughs> Uncharted, unfamiliar territory. Next verse. By faith he sojourned. What does that mean? It means to take a journey. In the land of promise as a stranger. In a strange country. Dwelling in tabernacles. That's another word for tents. With Isaac and Jacob. His son and his grandson. The heirs with him of the same promise. Next, next verse. For he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. In other words, he wasn't looking to build a home on this earth today. Ultimately, what he was looking forward to was the revealed plan of God. Now, if you'll go to verse, verse 13, I just wanted to show you a little bit more. We're talking about pilgrims. These all died in faith. They had mentioned Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Isaac, not having received the promises. That means they had been told that God had promises ultimately to give them a land called Israel. But ultimately that plan was bigger than what they could see. And that's what we have to understand. God's plan is bigger than just our individual lives. He wants to do something in our individual lives because it brings him glory. Amen. But he's got a bigger plan than just our individual lives. And Abraham and the rest of them had a revelation of that because they did not receive the promises. But they saw them far off. They could see that God was up to something. They could see that God's promises were in, were in the future. And, look at them, and they were persuaded of them. And embraced them. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This place is not your home. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. This place is not your home. Next verse. It says, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Next verse. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from where they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Mindful, I was looking it up, because this is old King James language, but so I can explain it to you a little bit. It means to, it means to embrace the memories of. If they would have been remembering constantly where they had come from, and the children of Israel too. Now, this is before Egypt, what we're talking about. So, this is like Abraham. If I would remember coming back out of my daddy's house... And all the good times that took place back there. Or if I would remember so much of my past and how good it was back then. Just like the children of Israel. If they would have kept remembering Egypt and kept longing to go back. They might have had the opportunity. In other words, constantly remembering. Constantly bringing to the forefront of the mind all the things that had happened in my past. That when just the right scenario happened. When just the right situation took place. They might have very well went back. How does that apply to your life? Well, I don't know. You got to tell me. I mean, you don't really have to tell me, but you got to. What is Egypt? We, we asked this Wednesday. What does Egypt look like to you? What are you, what are you talking about, preacher? What does your old life look like to you? What was it that you had in your old life that keeps calling your name? What was it in your old life that keeps wooing you back, whispers in the wind and says your name and says, hey, come back to me? Was it, was it an ex-relationship? Was it, was, it, was it a bottle? Was it, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Was it an old, I don't know what it could have been, but what I'm trying, you get the point I'm trying to make. Amen. 
What is it that calls you back to the old life? What is it that constantly tries to make your memory of the old life? Don't, don't act like they, they ain't never an old relationship whispering your name in the wind because people sing about it all the time. And, and, and everybody in the world is buying up their music. Adele singing from all the pain down the bottom of her soul, talking about hello from the other side. And everybody's like, oh, she's touching my feelings and I just know exactly what she's going through. So she ain't the only one. The world's hurting. And there's a past that they remember. And many times they roll their memories over and over again in their mind. And if you keep on thinking about the past instead of looking forward to the city that God built, you may have the right opportunity to go back to that. And the question is, if you left it the first time, it probably wasn't that good enough to go back to. we got to learn how to get a hold of Jesus. Amen? So you're a pilgrim. That was the main point I wanted to make with all of that. And this passage oh that we read describes Old Testament believers who followed God and their journey was based on promises, amen, that they had received. Amen. You know, sometimes, uh, once again, the direction that God calls us to go in doesn't make sense. If you'll go to Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. Why, God, why would you tell the children of Israel to turn when it doesn't make sense? Why would you tell me to go here when that doesn't make sense? God's got the answer for you right here. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> you thought you had something figured out, little Christian. But God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. He said, why? Because as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yeah. The closer you get to the Word of God, the better you understand the Word of God, the closer your thoughts become His thoughts and your ways become His ways. But He still wants each and every one of us to know, as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways and my thoughts are higher than yours. That's why I told you to take a turn right here when it didn't make no sense to you, when it didn't make no sense to them, because my ways are higher than your ways. And you got to learn how to hear me. And follow me. So when God gives direction to his people, the same coordinates that his people receive are confusing to the world. It doesn't make any sense. And in the passage that we're reading, once again, God told them to turn. Now, let me just say this. The same words, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll read verses 1 through 6. The same words that give direction to God's people cause confusion to the world because they are blinded to God's truth. Let me say that again. The same words that give direction to God's people cause confusion to the world. Why? Because they're blinded to God's truth. Look at this scripture. Paul writing to the church of Corinth, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. I can't help myself, but I feel like i got to explain everything that Paul's trying to write to us so that we can understand it. He's saying... I've been given a ministry. And what my ministry is, is that I must speak forth the truth of God's word so that people's lives will be changed by the gospel. So that their souls will be saved. I have to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. I have to make the world know that God had a plan for a savior and a sacrifice. I have to let them all know whether it's on, whether I got to ride a boat from Israel all across the Mediterranean Sea, take beatings on my back with whips and rods on my head, spend time in prison, get found cold and naked in the in a rainy in a winter storm. It doesn't matter. Nothing can stop me. I've been given this ministry. And therefore, I have received mercy, and I will not faint. That's the gospel. That's the man of God. Amen. Not, oh, let's go ahead and just water it down so everybody's happy, and they come to church, and they pay their tithe check, and we don't ruffle anybody's feathers, and we don't rock the boat. We don't want to poke nobody in the eye or step on anybody's toes because we don't want anybody mad. Man, we don't want to preach about sin. We don't want to talk about the sacrifice of the blood because it makes people think about sin because we don't want people uncomfortable. No, the Bible talks about sin. The Bible says that sin is the problem. The Bible says there was one only, only one answer for it, and that it was the precious dark of heaven, God's only son who never once failed, that had to be given to this sinful world that we live upon and die a, a, a crucified horrible death so that our sin could be paid for. That's love. That's mercy. That's grace. How do you, how do you, oh hallelujah. How do you describe the love of God? Through the sacrifice of his son. Nowadays in the modern church they want to write these 
flowery songs. I know I got myself in trouble last week at the house after church. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna write these songs, Oceans Deep, you know, and all this. And look, I don't have a problem with people using flowery language to describe something, but listen to me. If you want to know the, what the love of God looks like, you don't have to worry about how deep the ocean is. You don't have to worry about how high Mount Everest is. I know God created all of that, but what you need to have a revelation of is his son because he gave his son for you. His son never sinned. I'm the one that sinned. And Jesus, hallelujah, took my sin. That's God's love right there. Yeah. And it, listen to me. I'm not encouraging you like Rand said Wednesday night. Take the sin challenge. No. Don't take the sin challenge. Don't take another rap, lap around the wilderness. No. Don't do that. But if you do, and you fall on your face tonight, tomorrow, and next Friday, get back up. Because Jesus is love and his blood never dies out. His forgiveness is everlasting. Amen. It's tomorrow too. And it's the next day too. And sooner or later, I'm telling you right now, when you get a revelation of the love of the Lord and it overwhelms you. Come on somebody, help me out here. When it overwhelms you, he'll speak something to your heart. And when he speaks it to your heart, it'll be like what he told me one time. When they fall in love with me, Matt. When you fall in love with me. I'm not talking about love me. Oh, there's a whole lot of people that say that they love me. I'm talking about when you fall in love with me. You won't want to cheat on me anymore. Yeah. When the overwhelming love of God grabs a hold of your heart and you realize that as bad, as bad as you've been, he's been so good to you sooner or later. Hallelujah. It does something to you. Amen. So anyway, I didn't mean to go off on all that, but we have mercy, so we faint not. Next verse. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. Look at this. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Preachers today are handling the word of God deceitfully. They're not speaking the truth. Why? Because they don't want to offend the people. Paul said, we ain't handling the word of God deceitfully. We're going to tell you what the word of God says. The little Lord told me, this is how God talks to me. Man needs to keep his grubby fingers out of my word. He needs to quit manipulating my word. He needs to quit presenting it for the way he wants it to sound. And then my word needs to be presented for the way that it's written. And I think he was telling me that. Keep your grubby fingers out of my word too, son. You present my word for the way it's written. It says, God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Next verse. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's the world. That's the point I was trying to make. The same direction that God gives to his people causes darkness and blindness to the world. He said, if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost. But there's even people in the church that are lost. Because the spirit of deception is trying to cause confusion and put blinders on the eyes of people. Because the enemy doesn't want God's people for sure to be free and liberated to truly understand the word of God. Because then you become a force to be reckoned with. Because now that girl that you work with. I was thinking, I, was, I was, uh, saw Erica right there. The girl that cut your hair. The reason I say that is because before Cynthia started cutting my hair, I used to go to different girls all the time. Why? Because I just want to talk about Jesus. Well, I'm not going to. But anyway, you know, all hairdressers don't want to talk about Jesus. Sometimes they want to talk about other stuff. But, but then as soon as they would say the wrong little thing, it's like, hey, I hit him with Jesus. You know, the Lord, he'll change, you know, whatever. And dude, I got to tell so many people about the Lord by getting my hair cut. Amen. And uh, so praise God. I'm just saying that the enemy wants you to your eyes to be hidden to the truth because he doesn't want you liberated because now you're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Because yeah. everywhere you go, you're going to end up telling somebody about the goodness of God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Next verse. In whom the God of this world. Who's that? That's talking about the devil. Has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Or else, is another way you could say that, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The enemy or God of this world that wants to keep blinders on people's eyes blinds them from the truth of God because if the glorious gospel reaches in and shines the light in your heart, it's going to open up their eyes and they're going to be able to see the truth of the gospel. The same direction that God, the light that God gives his people for direction causes confusion to the world. God's word brings light and direction, but when God's word is rejected, the eyes of man become blind to the truth of God. Let's look at Exodus 14, 19 through 20. 
And it says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all the night. What is that saying? That's saying that the children of Israel, after the Passover, after the Red Sea, are caught between a rock and a hard spot. The Red Sea is before them. It hasn't been split open yet. And Pharaoh and all his army men are riding hot on their tail. They can hear the clanking coming. The, the army's on its way. And all of a sudden, the cloud of the Lord. Well, I did a research on this. This is the glory cloud right here. The, the, the Bible teaches that the cloud that sat upon the tabernacle was where God's glory was revealed. People are looking for the glory cloud. Guess what? It's the presence of the Lord. Amen. And what I, what I want you to know, though, is that this is the first time that the glory of God settled with the children of Israel. Later, it goes upon the tabernacle and it begins to lead them and guide them. And we're going to go there in a second. But right now, for the first time, the presence of God shows up. And what I want you to see is this. On one side to the world, it caused darkness. On the other side, to the children of Israel, they gave him light. See, the truth of God brings light to his people. But to the world, it, it ends up bringing darkness if it's rejected. You cannot continuously reject the word of God and not expect something bad to happen from it. What I'm trying to say is this, is that it will begin to sear your conscience and you can even begin to blind the eyes of the believer if we continuously reject the presence of the Lord. The same cloud that showed up as God's presence on that day and provided light in the night for Israel and darkness and blindness to the world is the same presence that guided Israel in the wilderness on their journey. I'm not even going to go there, but it's in Exodus chapter 40, and it says that God gave them a cloud by day and a fire by night, and that they didn't move unless the cloud moved. The point that I'm trying to make is that the presence of God wants to give us direction when we're on our journey. The presence of God wants to give us direction while we're walking this sojourn, while we're pilgrims on this land. Psalm 99, 7 through 8 says that he spoke to them through the cloud. The presence of God is the word of God. God's word is in his presence. His presence is in his word. And God's word and his presence revealed to man, to his people specifically, which direction he would have them to go. I don't know about you, but sometimes, Lord, I need direction. I need to know which way to go. I need your guidance. Amen. I'm here to tell you, though, if you don't know the word, you're going to have a hard time knowing his direction. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. First Peter 2, 2. I love this, this passage of scripture. The more I looked at it, at first I didn't... Long time ago, I didn't like it that much, but the more I broke it down, I really liked it. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So he's using liquid milk, liquid food that's given to a baby as an illustration for a newborn Christian and the fact that he needs food to grow. Now, a baby isn't cognitively aware of the fact that he needs the milk, the fat, the macros, the protein, the carbs, the fat, in order for him to grow. But if you try to take it away from him, see what happens. He's going to holler and scream and fuss till you give him what he needs. And I wonder if we're the same way. I wonder if as newborn babes we crave the sincere, pure milk of the word. I wonder if we really believe. That without understanding the word of God, we're going to be lost in a desert wilderness and that we're really not going to know the right direction to go. Why? Because we're going to have a tendency to hear what the world tells us to do and which direction it goes. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But what I'm here to tell you is this, is that if you don't know the word, you're going to have a hard time understanding the direction that God's trying to give you. Because you're going, your, your, your auditory skills are going to be clouded by what you've known in the past. Because, see, that's another thing about the pilgrim. Everything before him is uncharted territory, but everything behind him is familiar. Right. And so as he's walking and he doesn't know which way to go, he has a tendency to operate according to what he learned in the past. Yes. And what I'm here to tell you is, is that as a newborn baby, you got a new life. And there's, if you're going to grow this new life, you got to grow according to the word. Because we have a destination ahead of us. Amen. 
Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, the Apostle Paul describes this. He says, that's why we need the pure milk of the word. That's why we need to know the direction of God, because we're moving forward. We haven't arrived. Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, I haven't laid a hold of it yet. I haven't, I haven't come to the completion of the journey. He says, but this is one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind and reach forward unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. We have to grow in his word in order to understand his ways and to be able to move forward towards him for the call of our lives. For the, for the call that he has of our lives. Amen? Look, God desires to deliver people out of darkness. I'm just, for sake of time, Psalm 119, 105 says that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We're talking about direction. The presence of God spoke through the cloud. The, the light, the light of God's presence and the light of God's word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The lamp for the feet shows me where to take the next step. The light for the path shows me a little bit what's ahead of me. The word of the Lord, amen, wants to give us direction. John 1.14, the glory cloud, look at this. I never saw this before. You need to go to John 1.14. This is, this is good stuff right here. And this is another example of a multi-layered passage of scripture right here. Look at this. The word was made manifest, was made flesh. What does that mean? Who's the word? The word is Jesus. That's what it said. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Now it's saying the Word was made flesh. God made Him a human being. And He dwelt amongst us. Now this word dwelt right here. I've taught y'all this before. It literally means to sanctuary. It's literally talking about the Old Testament tabernacle. Just as the presence of God was in the Old Testament in the tabernacle, God's presence showed up in Jesus. Believe this. And we beheld His glory. Just as there was a glory, the glory of God was revealed in the cloud that was on top of the tabernacle. I never caught that before. The glory of God was manifest in Jesus. I mean, we know that. But you see the connection between Jesus and the tabernacle. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is your point? Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word that was manifest in the flesh. The Word reveals Jesus. The more we know Jesus, the more we know God, the more we know the direction that God was sending us in. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 46, I am come as a light into the world that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. You don't know where you're going when you're in the dark because you can't see. Physically and physiologically, you cannot see if you don't have light because light has to hit the retina in order for all the other stuff to take place. Spiritually, if you don't have the light of God and God's word on the inside of your heart, you can't see spiritually. Jesus said this in John chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. Well, this is what it says. He that believes on him, talking about Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this right here, this is the condemnation. This is what, this is what makes people condemned right here. Not because you're a homosexual. Not because you're a fornicator and adulterer. Not because you like to do drugs from time to time, get you a little nip. Not because you get a little sip. It's not, that's not what it did. This is what did it right here. Right here. This is the combination. Why? Because light came into the world and men love darkness. Because light came into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What condemns man is not because of all the stuff he does. But because he rejected the light that God sent. Amen. See, what happens is, is that the closer you get to the light, the more stuff's exposed. Yeah. It's like an x-ray machine. Yeah. I preached one time at the old church, and I'm just going to tell you, the mayor of the city. He may not remember, but he told me, so I'll say, the mayor of Franklin. He said, dude, you preached them two messages right there. It was like an x-ray in my soul. And it showed me everything. That's what the true gospel does. It ain't got nothing to do with the preacher. It's the word of the living God. When the light is shown, hallelujah, on the heart of man. It starts to expose all kinds of stuff that's on the inside of you. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do, He wants to show it to you. But then He wants to remove it from you. Hallelujah. Yes. And without the cross, none of that can happen. 
Because the cross removes sin, allows the Holy Spirit to have his way to come in and to begin to reveal. But men love darkness more than they love the light because evil men don't want their deeds exposed. Right. Lord, help us to desire exposure. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be exposed to the Lord than the world. Amen. 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 Lord, expose what's in me that's not of you yes. and allow it to be dealt with. The Apostle Paul says, listen, you need to judge yourself so that you're not judged. Judge yourself whether you be in the faith. Lord, wake us up! Sometimes sin will put us to sleep. Yeah. Wake us up, Lord! That we not fall asleep on the job. That we not get drunk, you know, spiritually speaking. That we would stay sober and that we would stay along the path. Amen? Amen. One reason that believers aren't hungry for the word is, once again, because light exposes darkness and men love darkness. All right. So basically, I'm going to wrap it up. The essence of my message was that God desires to give direction to his people because we're pilgrims on a journey. This place right here is in our home. Amen. He gives direction through his word and through his presence. But sometimes for the pilgrim, he remembers what's behind him and he doesn't know what's ahead of him. And because of that, sometimes he can be drawn and tempted to go backwards. But if you go backwards and you try to receive wisdom or counsel from what you knew before, yeah. the problem is all that wisdom and counsel is from deception because those people are blinded to the truth because the God of this world has blinded them. So you can't just go talk to your girlfriend at work. I'm sorry, the girl that you used to ask and bounce stuff off of in the past, you can't go to her no more. You need, you need, you need to call your Christian friend because the girl at work, she's going to tell you, what the girl that I used to work with said. Sometimes if you're going through some trouble in your marriage or something like that. Oh, Maddie, everybody does it now. It's okay. You, everybody gets a divorce now. You know, and at the time, dude, I wasn't doing good with the Lord. And I'm thinking to myself, well, my flesh wants to just kind of do whatever I want to do. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit was saying, what, you're going to listen to that? After all you knew from me, you're going to listen to that? That's garbage. You, all, you don't know nothing, but you ought to know better than that. That's the instruction of the world. The instruction of the world is going to tell you to go in another direction. You can't just go take all your thoughts to your old girlfriend that you, go, that you work with. What I mean girlfriend, you know, one girl talking to another girl. And you can't ask your boy. If you don't know the Lord. I used to work offshore, man. They're like, well, hand it sounds like to me. You ought to do this. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm going to listen to that, hoss. That's going to get me far in life. Although I will say, poor guy, he's dead now. His brother shot him. But uh, he, I was sitting there trying to witness to him. I was like, man, I'm telling you, the Lord going to change. Man, he's like, what, what about that dip in your lips, son? He told me that. I said, well, it's kind of hard. He said, yeah, but that's what the good Lord said when he was carrying that cross up the hill. Boy, it sure is hard. But you know what? He didn't quit. And he just kept on working. I was like, oh, man. Anyway, that was another story. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. The world has nothing to offer you because the world is blind. The world's been deceived by the God of this world. Right? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. You can't get your information from them. You can't get your help from them. This is what Paul told the church in Rome. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How are you a living sacrifice? That's an oxymoron. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but he lives in me. The old man born of Adam died with Jesus. A new man's been resurrected in Jesus. Amen. Now I'm a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at this. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or put to the test what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Two words that stick out to me. Don't be conformed, but be transformed. Both of those words describe a process. The word conformed literally means to be fashioned like unto. It's like a potter with a piece of clay. And he's fashioning it. See, you as a Christian, if you're not careful and you keep talking to old girl or old boy at work, or you keep listening, I'm, I always pick on worldly music. And the only reason I pick on worldly music, I didn't know why in the past they always said, y'all not listen to secular music. And now I realize because I hear it in the gym all the time. And that's all they're telling us to do. They're telling us to 
I mean, dude, you think that whenever they're singing about, I don't know, there's this one song where he's like, he's talking about he's driving. And he's like driving these curves. And he's talking about a woman's body is what he's talking about. He's, I'm taking these curves like, I can't remember what it was. Like he, like he got with my eyes closed. That's what it is. I'm taking these curves with my eyes closed. I'm not picking on your song. That's your song. I know it's somebody. Look, this happened to me the other day. Uh, the teacher's going to kill me over there with the kids. Listen, the other day I was in this room. And I was taking care of this, this little girl. And she's singing this song. I couldn't catch on to what she was singing because she couldn't even hardly sing. And, I, and she kept saying, you know what song I'm singing? And the mom said, she's trying to sing for you. And finally I realized, oh, she's singing that song that I heard in the gym about I'm taking these curves. And I said, yeah, well, uh, that, so he's talking about some woman's body. And he, like, he knows her body so well. He got his eyes closed and he knows how to navigate. Yeah, I said, well, I don't listen to worldly music anymore. She's like, oh. You're boring or something yeah. like that. <laughs> You're boring. And I said, well, you know. And I started to not say anything. And I said, well, because I've been so busy. But anyway, I said, well, you know what? The thing of it is that I don't listen to worldly music anymore because Jesus changed my life. Guess what? Lo and behold, old girl just got saved about nine months ago. And so, but her preacher, you don't think, told anybody in the church that they are not. But so now she's over here singing in the car with her daughter in the back saying, oh, yeah, we're going to take these roads. Let the curb of these roads with, my, with like the back of my head with my eyes closed. And she's over here remembering some man she had a relationship with. And, and you know, how come on, somebody. That's what they're singing about. He ain't talking about being with his wife in the bed. He's talking about some girl that he used to be with. With. And he's remembering her car and all this kind of stuff. And that's what the world's doing. Yeah. The world is trying to convince us to go the way that that's why you can't listen to that music. Yeah. Not, not just because I say it's wrong, because the world's got a different message. Yeah. We'll sit down on this pier right here and have myself a beer. Guess what? Tomorrow you're gonna wake up and you got the same problem, buddy. It, you, the world's going to tell you to enter into relationships with people that don't know the Lord. The world's going to tell you to explore your sexuality any old way you want to instead of doing it the way that the Lord did. The world's going to tell you to get you a little nip or a sip. The world's going to tell you to do all kind of stuff that you ain't supposed to do. And it's going to blind you to the truth. Do not be conformed to the world. They're trying to fashion and mold people according to their image. But instead be ye transformed. I love that Greek word. Metamorphized. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It describes the, the, the metamorphosis, really, of what we use of a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. The difference between conformed is that you're being molded from the outside. The world's influence is trying to turn you to look like them. The difference between that and being transformed is that something on the inside's happening. Yeah. See, it's in that caterpillar's DNA. When you got saved, now you became a partaker of the divine nature. Now the word of God is renewing your mind and teaching you the ways of God. And now what is in you is starting to come out of you. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word. And as you put the word of God on the inside of you, your mind and your heart begins to see things more the way God sees them. You receive direction from the presence and the, and the spirit of God. And you begin to go in the direction yeah. that God has called you to go.